Okay, great. Uh, Russ, if you want to move it over to the next slide, and we'll get going. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Greg Godero, and I am with Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Ren. Uh, and today you are joining us for the 2022 Single Family Residential Envelopes course with Russ King, our instructor. Uh, next slide, please, Russ. Um, so pretty much everybody knows how to use Zoom at this point. Please keep yourself muted and feel free to answer any or ask any questions in the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat as the course goes along and flagging Russ's attention um, for any questions that you may have. Um, next. Um, and then before we, oh, sorry, you can just click through all of these. I always forget that they're in here. Um, so before we dive in, I'm just going to give you all a little information about 3C Ren, who sponsors this course today. Uh, the Tri-County Regional Energy Network serves San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties, and we offer services for building professionals and households. Um, we are regulated by the CPUC, the uh, California Public Utilities Commission, and we're funded through a small tax percentage of everybody's energy utility bills. Next. Um, so I'm going to be the 3C Ren staff online today. I will leave my camera on and you'll be able to identify me through my name and background. Next slide. Um, and then these are the three programs that 3C Ren offers. Um, today, this course is uh, through our Energy Code Connect program. Next. And Energy Code Connect is our program that is for building professionals um, especially code professionals. We offer Energy Code Coach, which is uh, a live coach. You can see the website and um, phone number listed below. If you have any questions about the Energy Code, you can contact us through these methods uh, and you'll get a live response. Uh, and then we do trainings like those that we have today and regional forums, which are educational and networking opportunities um, that make the Energy Code easy to follow. Next. We also have our building performance training program that has um, education on technical and soft skills for building professionals, especially in the high performance building space. Next. And finally, we have our household facing program, which is home energy savings that is targeted to uh, multifamily buildings of five or more units, which offers rebates um, for doing um, energy saving upgrades and the single family up to four units that will put you in contact with a contractor uh, to um, make the upgrades that you need. Next slide, please. All right, so that is it from me. I will get to monitoring the chat and Russ, take it away. Awesome, thanks, great, appreciate it. Well, welcome everyone, it's nice to be here. Um, so today's class is uh, actually a class uh, written for Bayren, the Bay Area Regional Energy Network, and Bayren and 3C Ren cooperate a lot on some of their classes. Uh, and this class is one in a series. Uh, this particular class is specifically related to envelopes. Um, as far as a building feature goes in a house, uh, the envelope is the most important part of a house. Uh, some people might say, oh, well, what about the HVAC system? Well. The HVAC, HVAC system is actually responding to the envelope. Uh, so the envelope is the conditioned shell that, that, that separates the inside of the house from the outside of the house. And so if it's leaky, then the HVAC system will run a lot more. If it's got a lot of windows, the air conditioner might run a lot more and stuff like that. So yes, the envelope is extremely important when it comes to energy efficiency and obviously with enforcement to the California Title 24 Energy Code. So, uh, and this class is updated uh, for the new code, which just started on January 1st. We call it the 2022 code, uh, even though it starts on January 1st of 2023. Um, and so I have a lot of slides to cover because this is this normal class also includes a lot of slides that talk about what changed between the 2019 and the 2022 code. Um, so let's dive right in. All right. So. Uh, today's learning objectives is to understand the overall compliance process. In our Bayron training, we really like to 
sort of take a big picture overview to just kind of make sure everyone's kind of in the right mindset for what's going on when we talk about complying with the energy code. There's a very precise process that happens. And so we'll review that. Uh, we'll learn how to prioritize your time when plan checking and field inspecting residential envelope components. We'll understand the purpose and application of envelope and fenestration performance values, how sort of the qualitative numbers that are used to describe um, the, the quality of a wall, of a ceiling, of a floor, of a window, things like that. Uh, and then we'll, be, uh, we'll go over some best practices for energy code compliance at the very end. All right, so energy code compliance requirements for residential envelopes. Uh, before diving into the details of the energy code, it's first important to understand the overall process uh, and how different people fit into it. As you can see by all these gears, there's a lot of different organizations that are that come into play and they all interact with each other. Um, if you participated in the um, the approval process of the of the new code uh, about a year ago, um, you know that there were a lot of workshops, a lot of public hearings, a lot of um, documents being spread around, a lot of research going on in the background. Um, the utilities fund a lot of that. They fund a lot of the consultants who do a lot of the research for the energy code. One of the very interesting things about the energy code is that before they can make it a code requirement, they have to first prove that it is cost effective. In other words, the money that you spend on the energy feature that's being required will recover that, that, that value of energy within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so there's always a lot of arguing over how much a feature costs and how much energy it saves and stuff like that. But then something new that's come into the energy code is they've also, um, they've also some legislation has come through that has sort of fell on top of the energy code that also says we're really, really trying very, very hard to reduce greenhouse gases. And so there's some things of changing from uh, gas furnaces to heat pumps and things like that, where they're really encouraging um, heat pump heating systems and heat pump water heaters as opposed to gas water heaters. They still have to be relatively cost effective, but there's also some mandates to sort of emphasize and encourage switching from, from gas to electric, okay? So uh, it's always helpful to review the overall compliance um, options, the compliance paths, if you will. Um, the first thing everyone has to understand is that there's some mandatory measures. These are things you just always have to do. They're always going to be cost effective. They're always required. You just got to do them. Okay. And then after that, there's, there's a choice. There's a prescriptive path and the performance path. And a lot of people say, well, why is the energy code so complicated? Well, in its purest form, it's really not. It, in its purest form, it is a prescriptive list of measures. And if you just follow that list, you will meet the energy code. And I'll show you, I'll show you what those lists are. They're called the prescriptive tables, 150.1 A and B. And if you just find your climate zone, follow that list, put those things in the house, you'll meet the energy code. It's really that simple. The problem is not everyone wants to build their house that way. Some people don't want those kind of walls. Some people want more windows. Some people want to do this. Some people want to do that. So in order to provide that flexibility, they've come up with the performance path. And that's where it gets really complicated because then you have to model the house. So basically the performance path is saying, well, you don't wanna build your house the way the prescriptive measures say, if you can build it differently, but prove to us that it'll still use the same amount of energy or less than if you were to build it to the prescriptive packages, we'll let you build your house. And the only way to do that is to basically do two simulations one with your house that has the prescriptive measures and then one with your house the way you want to build it and then you compare those two numbers okay and then they you know then there's the with the solar stuff you have to make sure that the house itself is efficient and then you have to put on enough solar and then there's a new measure um that's sort of um the the source energy um requirement that sort of looks at where the energy is coming from and and that's where it starts taking into account the um, reduced greenhouse gases and stuff like that. So it, it, it gets pretty complicated after that point. Um, but the prescriptive path is very uncommon for new construction homes. Um, I would say 99.99% of all new homes use the performance path because it provides so much flexibility. Um, the prescriptive path is used on smaller additions. It's used on alterations and things like that. Uh, when I worked at CalCERTs, occasionally, every now and then, we'd get a, a prescriptive new house would come through 
And we all like, oh, check out, it's a, it's a, a CF1R NCB. Oh, we haven't seen one of those in a long time. They're very, very rare. The vast, vast majority of homes use the performance path for new construction, okay? And, but you can also use the performance path for an alteration. Uh, what you do is you model the house and you show that, well, I can't do the alteration exactly the way they want me to. I'm gonna do something else instead to sort of make it as efficient as it should be. The only time I ever really see those is when they kind of screw up and they get caught doing something wrong and then it's too expensive to go back and fix it. Um, and so they say, well, all right, let's do something else instead. What do we need to do? And then they do the performance path to figure that out. So that's kind of where that comes in. So anyways, think of the prescriptive path as the easy but, but strict method and the performance path as the tricky, difficult, complicated, but flexible method, okay? There we go. So here's that list of prescriptive measures that I was talking about. It is in, uh, it is in the energy code. It's table 150.1-A. Um, and this is the single family. Oh, there's no B anymore. I forgot. I need to fix that slide. Sorry about that. Um, and you'll notice that it's, it's, these columns are by climate zone. So there's 16 columns here. You have to find which climate zone you're in and then just follow down that list. And that's what you need to do to make your house comply, okay? Now, like I said, very, very few new construction homes do this. So really the way to look at this table is think of it as this is what you're being compared to. You don't have to do what's on this list, but you, if you don't, if you're doing something that's not as good as what's on this list, you're gonna have to do something else that's better to make up for that. And the way you demonstrate that is by running a computer simulation, okay? In the compliance software, either CBEC Res or Energy Pro, okay? All right, so this is, um, so this today's class is about envelopes. So I wanted to show you some of the envelope measures. So if you look over here on the far left, it'll say building envelope, then you got roof ceilings, and there's a lot of different options. You got below deck roof insulation, ceiling insulation, radiant barrier, um, that's option B. There's these option B and option C that has to do with um, vent, uh, high performance and regular attics and things like that, whether your ducts are in conditioned space or in the attic and things like that. So <clears throat> there's a lot, there is some options in the prescriptive measures. Then you get down here to walls, you got below grade and above grade walls, frame wall, mass wall, interior, mass wall, exterior. And then, um, so you see some R values here, whether radiant barrier is required or not. Notice that it's required in some climate zones, but not others, okay? Remember I said that the energy code has to be cost effective and whether something is cost effective or not depends on the climate that it's in. If it's a cooling measure and it's in a really hot climate like Palm Desert, it's gonna save a ton of energy. But a cooling measure in Arcata up in Humboldt County is not gonna save much money. So it's much less likely to be cost effective. And so they do, they run all these cost effectiveness analyses in each of the 16 climate zones. And by the way, they've already started the development of the 2025 code that's that's coming up <laughs> three years from now. So those those calculations and those workshops have already started for the next round of code. And we've only been in the current code for a few weeks. I, I personally think that's a little fast, um, but uh, I, I like to say that the energy code, the learning curve on the energy code is about three years. And as soon as you figure it out, they change it on you. Uh, but anyways, that's just me. All right, <clears throat> so this is another page. So there's like three or four pages to this table. The next page shows more buildings. We've got floors, roofing products, fenestration, which is a fancy word for windows, and then doors, okay? Again, by climate zone, uh, floors. Um, if you have in a certain climate zone, this is slab perimeter insulation. You'll notice that in climate zone 16, which is up in the mountains, Truckee, Tahoe, um, those sorts of places. You are required, or the I should say, the prescriptive packages show that you that the house you're being compared to will have slab edge insulation. Okay, um, so we got raised floor insulation, concrete raised floor insulation, and so on. QII is required in all climate zones. Okay, and then we got some roofing products. You know that in some of the hot climate zones, 13 and 15, uh, they do require a cool roof product and things like that. Okay, so that's the prescriptive measures. But most homes use the performance approach. So you create a model in the CBEC Res software, you run CBEC Res, it actually does two different simulations. It does the house with uh, the prescriptive measures on it. And that, that's called the standard house, that becomes your target. 
and then it does the house the way you want to build it. That's called the proposed house. It does two separate simulations and it compares them. Okay. And if they compare well, uh, it passes. Okay. And then once it passes, you generate a certificate of compliance. All right. Uh, that, that word is a little, that name is a little misleading, calling it a certificate of compliance. What it should be called is the certificate of what you're supposed to do in order to obtain compliance. Okay. But that name's too long. But it's basically a list of features that you've said, I'm gonna put this in the, in the house. And if you do, you've demonstrated that it will meet the energy code. All right, so we're gonna go, we're gonna look at that CF1R, that, by the way, that certificate of compliance, the CF1R is called a CF1R PERF01. And we're gonna look at that in a little while, all right? Let's see, this example, by the way, you'll see this watermark on here, it says not usable for compliance. That's because I just wanted to use a generic uh, uh, form that can I didn't send it off to the HERS provider to be registered or anything like that. Building departments do not accept a form that has a, a watermark like that. You'll want to see either the Cheers or the CalSearch logo in the background of that watermark, okay? All right. Um, Russ, there was a, a comment in the chat asking you to mention that radiant floors on slab require slab insulation. Um, that is a true statement. Yes, radiant floors on slab require slab insulation. I believe that is a mandatory measure, not a prescriptive measure. Um, so yes, if you choose to do radiant floors, uh, the mandatory measures say that 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 they have to have um, uh, slab edge insulation. But what I was showing was the prescriptive packages. Um, radiant floors, I, radiant floor is not a prescriptive measure, so you would have to do the performance approach, I believe. Um, to, to do uh, radiant floors. But what, in Clemson 16, it's even without radiant floors, the prescriptive measures require um, slabage insulation. All right, good comment. All right, so you run your compliance, you get your CF1R PERF01, you follow the CF1R PERF01. Now, one of the challenging things is that things change. This is based on the original set of plans that gets submitted to the building department. And trust me, I know from experience that People change their mind as they're building a house. They go, oh, let's do this different. Let's do that different. Let's do this different. And sometimes that CF1R doesn't get updated. And that's a, that's a real problem. So <clears throat> for you energy consultants out there, you engineers out there, anytime you make a change to the house that potentially could change the energy features, you got to rerun that CF1R. And the nice thing is the CF1Rs live in the HERS registry, which is an online accessible database. And so by definition, whatever CF1R that you see when you log into the HERS registry, that is the most recent CF1R. Don't rely on the printed versions. The, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll make one part of the plan set that they submit. That one's almost guaranteed not to be correct at the end of the project. I can almost guarantee that. So do, do keep in mind that these things change and it, they evolve as the house is being built, okay? So mandatory measures must always be met regardless of the compliance approach, whether you're doing prescriptive or performance. Mandatory measures are shown on most of the CF2R forms, and I'll talk a little bit more about CF2R forms in a minute. Um, they're all found in section 150.0. They include things like minimum efficiencies for equipment. What's the least efficient air conditioner I can install? What's the least condition efficient heat pump I can install? What's the least efficient water heater I can install? Those sorts of things are mandatory measures. They also include um, things like, um, um, lighting, switching and, and switching and controls for indoor lighting and things like that. Those are mandatory measures. You cannot trade those off. You have to do them all the time, okay? Uh, one of your handouts is the 2019 low-rise residential mandatory measures summary, or we call it the residential, or the, the mandatory measures checklist. Um, it used to actually have check boxes, but it doesn't anymore. Uh, but anyways, it's a list of all the mandatory measures. Some apply, some don't, depending on the project, okay? And some of these mandatory measures, you'll see things like, um, it will say, if required, then you must do that. So that's an example of, of the um, slab edge insulation for um, radiant floors. If radiant floors be installed, slab edge is, is required, okay? Things like that. So here's just a zoom in on it. You can see all this stuff, air leakage, labeling of windows, Still fabric existing doors, air leakage, that's an important one, okay? Insulation requirements and radiant barrier. Um, when required, radiant barriers must have emittance of blah, 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 and be certified by so-and-so, okay? So those are all kinds of mandatory measures. We'll talk a little bit more about those. 
All right, this is another one of your handouts. Um, we came out with this quite a while ago uh, and it's, we found it extremely useful. It's a one page diagram of the entire compliance process for residential new construction and additions, okay? So if you look at the far left-hand side, you'll see start here and then there's three basic steps, okay? The first step says what's required, the second step says what's installed, and the third step says what's verified. So you first thing you have to do is figure out what's required. That's figuring out your what your, goes on the CF1R. The next thing is installing it, and then the third thing is verifying it. That's the three basic steps of complying with the energy code. What's required, what's installed, what's verified. Install, or sorry, <laughs> figure out what's required, install it, verify it. That's actually accommodated by the three basic types of forms that we have, the CF1R, the CF2R, the CF3R, one, two, three, it's very logical, okay? So you figure out what's required, that's all get taken care of and, and plan checked, all right? Then you install it, whatever that CF1R says, put those things in the house. And then the third thing, the very important part is have somebody check it. Some of those things are checked by the building department, some of those things are checked by third party special inspectors called HERS raters, okay? It's important that there's good communication throughout those steps. The plan check needs to talk to the field inspection, um, the HERS rater, the field inspector need to communicate, the energy consultant and the HERS rater need to communicate. It is not a, this is not a black box industry where everyone's looking, working in their own little cubicle and expecting everyone else to do their job. You have to communicate along the way for this to work well, okay? Um, the forms facilitate this process. The CF1R tells you what you're supposed to do. The CF2R is a certificate of installation. It's signed by the installer and it documents what was actually put in. And then the 3R is the certificate of verification. That is for measures that are inspected by the third party HERS rater. And it's proof that it was passed, that it was tested and passed by the, by the third party inspector, okay? So how does that apply to an actual project? Well, it depends on your compliance path. If you choose the performance approach, which most people do for new construction, the performance approach, um, you use the compliance software to determine which energy features are required. You get it to pass in the software and then you print or issue or generate that CF1R perf one okay? In the prescriptive approach, the energy features are determined by those tables that I showed you. You follow the table and you document that on CF1Rs but for, um, there's different kinds of prescriptive measure or, or prescriptive projects. There can be alterations, there can be additions, there can be newly constructed buildings. So there's a lot of different kinds of CF1Rs depending on the type of project. So the ALT means alterations, the ADD means uh, additions, and the NCB stands for newly constructed buildings. But you basically follow the list, you fill out the appropriate CF1R, and there you go, install those things and you'll be good. So that stuff then, all needs to go with the plans to the plan checker and the plan checker needs to check those things, okay? Not as easy as it sounds, all right? So you have a set of plans which describe the house and then you've got this big packet, this big document called a CF1R Perf01 that lists all the walls, it lists all the windows and stuff like that. And you have to make sure that the, that the model of the house actually matches the plans. And so there's some steps in there adding up all the glass area, comparing it to the plans, adding up all the wall area, comparing it to the plans, adding up all the floor area, comparing it to, to the plans. Because if the computer model is not accurate, if it doesn't reflect the house, then the features may not be correct for the house, okay? And then what are all the important features, uh, the window types, the wall types, insulation and stuff like that, that should actually be in the plans as well. It, it, over and above just having the CF1R you know, printed in the plans, on the plans, on the sections, it should show the R values. On the, on the floor plans, it should have a, a window schedule that has the U factor and solar heat gain coefficient of the windows that matches the CF1R, okay? It's all about communication, all right? It's all about staying up to date and communicating. Well, once that's all done and ready to go, then the permit gets issued and they can start building the house. So now we go out into the field and then all of the features in a house, and there's dozens and dozens of them, all the features in the house are divided into two categories based on who's going to check them. So it, all of them have to have a CF2R, okay? All the features are going to be installed, 
So somebody has to take responsibility for that installation and it's the installer. The installer signs a document and says, I, I read the CF1R, I knew what I was supposed to install. And they say what they put in and they sign it. And that think of that as a signed affidavit saying that they put in the right stuff. So the water heater, the plumber has to sign a CF2R saying they put in the right water heater. It'll list the make and model number. The HVAC contractor will sign the MECO1 listing the make, model, and serial numbers of the heating and cooling system that they installed um, and so on and so forth. So in the window installer will sign a CF2R saying they put in all the right windows. So every single feature gets a CF2R signed by the installer. Then the two different categories of features, depending on who's, who's uh, checking it in the field, then may or may not get a third form. All of the HERS measures get a third form called the CF3R. Um, all of the non-HERS measures, we don't make building departments fill out forms for that. So those don't really have forms. It's just up to the building department to check those things. But all the HERS measures, because they're being verified by a third party and the building department needs to know that they were checked, they get that third form, the CF3R. All of these forms are online. They all live in the HERS registries. They all can be accessed with a smartphone that has internet access. You can call up the project. There's a thing called a project status report. It lists all the forms and it'll have a green dot or red dot next to it telling it whether it's been completed or not. So we have a class on the HERS, how to use the HERS registry. And what we teach building departments is go to the HERS registry for the project, make sure all forms green dots before you final a project, okay? It gives you a nice, quick, fast update on that project to see what's on the forms, okay? Is there a question, Gray? Um, yes, Arthur Henson asked about if there's any workarounds for requirements that fenestration have a label. Um, he notes that many local smaller door and window manufacturers don't have actual and FRC labels and are limited to major manufacturers um, for testing. Yeah, I, I seem to recall, I have not checked to see if it's still in the new code, but I seem to recall that there was an exception for a certain percent or a certain amount of square feet in each house for like custom windows because you know, some houses, they like to have stained glass windows and stuff like that, which won't be labeled. Um, it's, I seem to recall that there was an exception. So I would go to section 150.0 in the standard, find the fenestration requirements, and it should, it should say there what the, what the exception is uh, for that. Um, yeah, there used to also be sort of a way to do sort of a, a modeling of the window, um, but I think that was more commercial where you could sort of, there was software you could buy that you could model it. It was like NFRC software and you can model the window and it would kind of give you a rough approximation of the of the U factor and then you could print out a certificate. Um, but um, yeah, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure exactly what the details are, but it would be in section 150.0, find fenestration and it should say there, yeah. All right, moving along. So again, all HERS measures get a CF2R and you'll notice that the CF2Rs have this fancy numbering system, which I'll show you in a second. And if they ended in an H, that means that measure is a HERS measure and it will get a CF3R that sort of covers up that CF2R. All the CF2Rs that ended in E, E stands for enforcement agency, means it's, it's um, uh, inspected by the building inspector. All right, so there you go. Uh, use that. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, so now that we kind of understand the process, now we're gonna now we're gonna look at a, um, at how envelopes fall into this process. Okay, so envelope. There's gonna be some envelope stuff in the tables for prescriptive. There's gonna be some envelope stuff on the CF1R. Some HERS measures for envelope stuff. A lot of non-HERS measures for envelope stuff, and uh, we're gonna see how those fit into the process and uh, what forms are necessary for those. All right, so this is sort of a special section. This is um, the reorganization of the 2022 code. So this is really talking about what's changed uh, compared to the 2019 code. Um, this doesn't specifically talk about envelopes. So I'm gonna kind of go through it a little bit quickly, but um, it's important to understand that, so this is the 2019 code. This is how the code was organized uh, last code cycle. And so you got subchapter one, this covers everything, okay? And then you basically had low-rise residential and not low-rise residential, okay? Low-rise residential included low-rise multifamily, three stories and less. And then not low-rise residential included commercial buildings, hotels, motels, 
and high-rise residential. So you had, uh, sorry, high-rise multifamily. So you had some multifamily on the one side and some multifamily on the other side. And somebody said, hmm, wouldn't it be nice if multifamily had its own section? Well, that made a lot of sense at the time. We didn't realize how complicated it was going to be. Uh, but what they did is they, is they took some of the low-rise multifamily stuff and some of the high-rise multifamily stuff, pulled that all out and created a third section. And now the 2022 code, 2022 code looks like this. So let me go back 2019, low rise, not low rise, 2022, three sections, um, single family residential, multifamily, low rise and high rise, and then not residential. So that's um, commercial, uh, industrial, uh, hotel, motel. Okay. All right. So that's kind of how the, the code's been reorganized. And you'll see a lot of repetitious language between uh, they, they had to cut and paste a lot of the single family stuff and put it over into the multifamily stuff because there's a lot of similarities uh, between the dwelling units and stuff like that. Uh, so the code gotten much, much thicker in terms of the number of pages. Um, but in some ways it's simplified things in other ways it's made it more complicated. Um, so the jury's kind of still out as to whether that was a good idea or not, but it's done. So there we go. Okay, um, there we go. Uh, another thing that's been added, and this has to do with a way to quantify greenhouse gases. And so what they've done is they've come up with a new energy design rating. If you remember in the 2019 code, they introduced EDRs. And think of the EDR as basically your energy use um, divided by, yeah, divided by the energy use of, a, of your house if it was built a long time ago, of an old version of your house. And so it's a percent. So if, if the EDR is 100, that means you're the same energy use. If your EDR is 50, it means you use 50% less energy than an older version of your house. So, so that's what a rating is. It's a, it's a relative number. Um, and then they have um, this EDR source energy that includes all these things. And you notice they're, they're basically the same all the way across. So source energy, um, is just a way to account for where the energy comes from, okay? And it's your envelope, indoor air quality, HVAC, water heating, and then a lot of unregulated loads, all right? And then your TDV efficiency, TDV is the time of use valuation of a unit of energy. You know, electricity is more valuable in the afternoon when a lot of it's being used um, than, it, than, it, than a unit of electricity in the, in the middle of the night. And so when you save energy, they're trying to, they give more value to saving energy that's that's more valuable, okay? And that's all what TDV is about. Um, this is this is the TDV of the house without the renewables on it. So you have to make sure that your house is efficient first, and then you can put your renewables on it, your solar and your battery and stuff like that, okay? So the efficiency TDV is the house by itself, and then the total TDV is the EDR is the house with the renewables and it has to pass both of those, okay? So now there's three things that, that um, the house has to pass. They, and they've combined these two into one. They say there's two, but there's really three. It's EDR one and then EDR two, which has two things in it, okay? There you go. Um, method um, has to meet all three of those. So the source EDR has to pass, the efficiency EDR has to pass, and the total EDR has to pass, okay? And that's all, the nice thing is that's all handled by the software. It'll tell you that it passes. When you print out the CF1R, uh, Perfo1, it, it says right on there. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, and then to define single family, um, it, it does include things we've used to kind of consider multifamily. Single families include townhouses. So those are attached homes, but they're, it, they're vertically, there's nothing above them, okay? So it's houses that are only attached side by side. Uh, residential occupancy R3, uh, buildings of occupancy R3, other than multifamily or hotel motel, building of occupancy 3.1, and buildings with occupancy U on a residential site. So there you go. All right, let's talk about some of the forms. Lots and lots of forms. So here's the uh, secret decoder ring key for determining what a form means. If you look in the upper right-hand corner of an energy code form, uh, it's got this little code, usually starts with CF. So it's gonna be CF one, two, or three, certificate of compliance, certificate of installation, certificate of verification. 
those three steps I talked about. Okay, so that number is going to go right there. And then R stands for residential. So all of the residential compliance forms start with CF1, 2, or 3, and then R. And then there's three letters after that. The CF1R, the three letters describe the type of project or the compliance approach. Is it a performance approach? Is it a newly constructed building? Is it an addition? Is it an alteration? So the CF1Rs, those three letters will describe these things here. And then there'll be a number. And then at the end, there'll be an E and H, okay? But the two Rs and three Rs are a little different. In the two Rs and three Rs, these next three letters describe the building component that is being um, handled by that form. And your choices are a envelope, ENV, which is what today's class is about, EXC for existing conditions, mechanical lighting, plumbing, solar photovoltaic, solar ready access, solar thermal water heating, and then there's these worksheets, okay? So uh, CF2 and three, these will describe the building component. And then there's a two digit number after that, that um, just separates all the forms. You have a, you can have a MEC 01, a MEC 02, a MEC 43, you know, MEC 37, MEC 25, MEC 22. So there's a bunch of different forms, but if it says MEC, it means they all have to do something with the mechanical system. Um, and if it's a two, it means it's a certificate of installation. If it's a three, it means it's a certificate of verification and so on and so forth. And then, like I said, the very last letter, if it's an E, E stands for enforcement agency. That means that the building inspector is gonna check that feature. If it's an H, H stands for HERS Rater, and it means the HERS Rater is going to inspect that feature. Okay. All right. So that's the secret decoder ring. Now let's look at some actual forms. So if you go to, you can just Google this 2022 Residential Compliance Manual, and then you have two choices. You can download it as one big, huge, gigantic, monstrous document, PDF form, or you can look at it by sections. And there is something called Appendix A. And if you look at Appendix A, that's all the forms. And um, there's a table of contents there. And that's what you're looking at right here. It's, it's five pages and it's a list of all the forms. And I find it very useful. So it lists all the CF1Rs first. And I've just highlighted all the envelope forms because that's what today's class is about. Um, but all these CF1R E and B forms, they're really just worksheets. They're forms that help if you're doing the prescriptive approach and you're not using a computer, you have to sort of manually calculate like weighted averages and solar heat gain coefficients and stuff like that. Um, so there's worksheets to do that. These are very rarely used. So don't worry too much about these. The important ones are these other ones. Um, PERF is a really important one. Uh, there's some other plumbing worksheets and stuff like that, okay? But let's look at the, um, the, the other ones. So here's the CF2Rs. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. CF2Rs that deal with envelope measures. One, two, three of them are non-HERS measures and one, two, three of them are HERS measures. So you've got fenestration, windows is a non-HERS measure. Insulation, uh, is the actual insulation itself is a non-HERS measure. Uh, roofing is a non-HERS measure. Uh, building envelope leakage diagnostic, that's a blower door test. That is a HERS feature that measures infiltration of the house. So the installing contractor has to say, I'm going to put all these things in and um, I know the house is gonna be tested. And I certified that it's gonna be tested by HERS rate and that it passed, okay? And then the HERS rater comes and does their test. That'll be a CF3R, we'll see that in a second. And so on and so forth. But then QII, the insulation, the quality insulation inspection, which is gonna be on most homes, it's a prescriptive measure. It could be traded away, but it's very difficult to trade away. Um, so it is gonna be on most homes. There's two inspections. There's one at the framing stage, and then there's one at the end when the installation gets installed. And that's what these forms are for. Two R's, certificate of installation. These have to be signed by the installing contractor, basically taking responsibility for making sure that these are installed correctly and they passed. Now, the HERS rater then has to come and inspect it. So the next page of the table of contents, Nothing on here about HERS. We're still, look at all these CF2Rs for mechanical systems. There's tons of those. Then we get down here to the CF3Rs and there's three CF3Rs for envelope. There's the building uh, leakage diagnostic and then the two QII forms. So these are the HERS raters forms. Notice that there's no CF3R for the non-HERS measures. Let me go back a couple. So there's a CF2R, ENV01, E, ENV03, and ENV04. 
Here's another little trick for you to know. If the number is 20 in the 20s, that's a hers measure. If it's less than the 20s, if it, it's a non hers measure. That's another uh, little secret decoding trick. Um, so these end in an E, there is no three R's for these. These that end in an H, there is three R for those. And that's those right here. Question? Um, yes. Michael asked, what is being inspected for QII at framing versus installation? Ah, Michael, I highly, highly recommend you take the Energy Code Ace, the QII training class. It's fascinating. It's very interesting. Uh, I teach that class with uh, Gina Rada. Uh, also, go to the CalCERT website, calcerts.com, go to resources, and there's a QII handbook. Download that. That's super, super useful. It's free download PDF file. In the uh, framing stage, the one of the really fascinating things about QII is that they say it's all about insulation. Insulation doesn't work unless the house is tight. Unless If air is passing through that insulation, it's not working at all. So what they're inspecting for at the framing stage is to make sure everything is properly sealed first, that there's a good air barrier behind the insulation so that when you put the insulation in, the air is not moving through the insulation, making it useless, okay? So it's all about caulking and sealing and air barriers and stuff like that. Then the insulation gets put in and they wanna make sure that it's, that's done well. So that's the, that's the insulation stage. Yep, great question. There's a, that's, a, that's a very uh, complicated topic. We have a whole class just on that topic. Um, all right, so there's, and then the rest are all just mechanical forms. Lots of HERS testing for mechanical forms. Okay, registered versus non-registered. If a house needs at least one HERS measure, that project, the entire project has to be registered with the HERS provider. We have a whole class on how to use the HERS registry. Um, just know that it's an online database. When a CF1R gets generated and gets uploaded to the registry, the registry then figures out what forms are required. It creates a list of those forms. And then as those forms are filled out and completed and signed in the registry, they, people log into the registry and sign those forms. Each, the, the little red dot will change to a green dot next to each one of those forms. So it's really easy, quick glance. The, the building department just goes up, looks at it, can see red dots, say, ah, I can't file this project until all those red dots are taken care of. Uh, wait till there's all green dots, say, okay, cool, everything's done, everyone's taking responsibility, everybody's signed their forms, all the tests have been done, then they can final the project, okay? That, that report, that list with the green dots and red dots is called the project status report. Super, super useful, okay? Um, HERS registries are online tools that help track of all the forms. There are two HERS providers that have registries. So you have to know which registry to look at. So remember I said, if you look at a CF1R, make sure it has a watermark for either CalCERTs or CHEERS. That's how you know which registry to look at. The CF1R will have a, have a watermark with the CalCERTs logo or the CHEERS logo. You log into that registry. They both work approximately the same. They do base, they're required to do certain things by the Energy Commission. So they're going to operate fairly similarly. So you log in. Find the project. You can search by all different kinds of ways. Look at the project status report. Look at the green dots and red dots, and off you go. All right. So, what forms will be used for envelope measures? Let's see, I'm checking the time here. We're doing pretty good. Uh, forms that will be commonly used for envelope measures: CF1R certificates of compliance. Remember, this is. First, so the CF1R lists the features that are required in order to comply with the energy code. Follow the CF1R. The most common one for new construction is the PERF-01. Um, this is used when the performance approach is used to demonstrate compliance of any kind of project. It is generated by the software. It is used for most new construction and most larger additions where they were. Um, there's no hard and fast rule. There is it is easier to make a house comply, make an addition comply prescriptively. So it just depends on the addition itself. Um, I've seen fairly large additions comply prescriptively. And I've seen really, really small additions have to use the performance approach. So it just, it usually depends on how much glass they're putting on the addition, whether or not they have to use the performance approach, okay? I mentioned the NCB, the CF1 or NCB, very, very rare. Um, uh, occasionally we would see those come through CalCERTs and we'd all get excited about it and go, wow, you know, somebody actually sat down and did the prescriptive approach on a new house. Um, and it's very rare, but th it's there and it can be done. Uh, CF1R ADD is um, for prescriptive um, 
additions. And it depends on whether you have HERS features or not. If you don't have HERS features, it's a handwritten form. If you do have HERS features, it gets, it gets uploaded to the HERS registry. And then the alts for alterations, the 01 and 05, again, HERS and non-HERS. Um, the ALTO one is very common for uh, HVAC alterations. There's an ALTO two for HVAC alterations. Actually, that's actually down here. If it's only HVAC alterations, it's the ALTO two and things like that. Um, so you won't see those for envelopes. But for envelopes, uh, the PERFO one could have envelope stuff in it. We'll definitely have envelope stuff in it. The NCB will. The ADD might have some, probably, if it's an addition, they're adding walls and stuff like that. Um, and then the ALT 0105, maybe. Uh, if it's roofs and windows and walls, it, it certainly could, okay, have um, envelope features in it. So you need to know how to read these forms and how to find the envelope features in it. And we're going to look at a PERF 01. Okay. Um, CF2Rs that deal with envelopes. We talked a little bit about this. The NV, um, these are non HERS measures. So, windows, insulation, and roofing products. These are certificates of installation. They're signed by the installer saying, I put on the right windows, I put in the right insulation, I put on the right roofing materials. Okay. And they're signed by the installer. And then there's some HERS measures envelope leakage, the blower door tests, the framing stage QII, and the insulation stage QII. Now these are hers verified, but these are two R's. They have to be filled out and signed. Well, they, they have to be signed and uh, the responsibility is taken by the installer. It, it honestly, it doesn't really matter who fills them out. What matters is who signs them, who's taking responsibility for, for the features on that form, okay? And it's just the H means that then those forms are eventually gonna be filled or verified by the hers rater, which means we need that third form, the CF3R. So here's the CF3R. For each CF2R that ends in an H, there is a CF3R that goes along with it. The HERS registry will help make sure the correct two R's and three R's get used and completed. This is a screenshot of a, of a project status report of a project in the, in the CalSearch registry. And this is kind of what you'll see. So you'll see all these two R's for this project. And this is a customized list for that project. Uh, a different project might have a different list depending on what was on the CF1R. So this CF2R forms, here's the fenestration, envelope, insulation, roofing, space conditioning systems. Um, and you can see the red dot means it's not done yet. The green dot means it's done, okay? And this little example here is actually quite common. You'll notice that for all the CF2Rs that, um, that in these don't show the H's on them, they do now. Um, this must be an old print, uh, they'll, the dash H, for all the CF2Rs um, that end in an H, there's a green dot, and all the ones that don't, there's not a green dot. That's very common because what happens is the rater has to do their stuff, and the rater will call the installer and say, I have to do my stuff until your form is filled out and signed. So all of the CF2Rs that end in an H have a HERS rater pestering the installer, going, Look, you need to sign this form before I can, do, uh, before I can sign mine. But there's not a HERS rater doing that for the non-HERS forms. And those are usually the last ones to get signed. Some very frequently, they don't get signed at all because the building department doesn't check them. Um, but it's then it's the building inspector who has to make sure that those non-HERS CF2Rs get filled out, okay? So this is very, very typical of what you'll see if you go in and look at a project uh, in the, in the um, HERS provider, okay? All right. Uh, let's talk about performance values now. How do, you, how do you quantify how energy efficient a wall is? We all know about R value. How do you quantify how energy efficient a window is? How do you quantify how energy efficient roofing is? Okay, that's what we're gonna talk about next. So important performance values for building assemblies are for all opaque surfaces. Opaque is kind of a strange term. Uh, that's a surface on a house that's opaque. That means it's, that sun can't shine through. And that's intended to separate it from windows, okay? Windows and do gla doors with glass in them and stuff like that. Because windows and things like that have solar gains that, that allows heat to come into a house. Opaque surfaces don't have that. So that's basically everything but glass. So windows, walls, floors, ceilings. I, I said windows, that's wrong. Walls, floors, ceilings, and opaque doors. Um, all are described by R value, U factor, and maybe some other things. Okay, do you have a question? 
Yes, sorry. Yes. Ellen Construction asked, would it be the general contractor who signs or the trades? Ah, good, good, good question. The um, general contractor can sign. I don't recommend that. The purpose of the CF2R is to make the installer take responsibility for their work. That is, that is why the CF2R came to be. It used to be that all the responsibility fell on the general contractor and general contractors got tired of their installers not putting in the right stuff and them getting in trouble. So they said, we need a form to make the installers take responsibility for what they're putting in. And, and that was the CF2R. And, but sometimes you got to choose your battles, right? Sometimes it's just really hard to find someone, get them to sign this, to log into the registry and sign the form. So, and you just want to close out your permit and just be done with it. The general contractor can go in and sign that form. But if it turns out that the wrong water heater was installed and the general contractor doesn't know anything about what kind of water heater was supposed to be installed, they just know, oh, they just put in a gas water heater, it must be good. Um, the general, the general contractor could be responsibility for responsible for fixing that problem. Okay, so we don't recommend that the GC signs the CF2Rs, but they can if they want to. All right, good question. Okay, so all opaque surfaces have an R value. That's that describes the insulation that's inside that wall, and it also has a U factor that describes the entire assembly of the wall: framing, siding, you know, sheathing interior sheathing, anything like that. This U factor describes everything. The R factor usually only describes the insulating materials. For R value, higher is better. For U factor, lower is better. U factor describes heat transfer. How well does it transfer heat? So you want a low number, okay? R value is resistance. It's how well does it resist heat transfer? So you want a high number. I know that's confusing, but that's how it is. And then roofs are interesting. Roofs have two numbers that we look at solar reflectance and thermal emittance. Um, solar reflectance is kind of obvious. It's how much heat of sunlight is hitting that roof, how much of it bounces off. That's reflectance. Thermal emittance means if how much heat does it reflect, say at night, okay? If that attic is hot and the roof surface is hot, how well does it emit that heat back into the sky, okay? So in hot climates, you want a lot of reflectance, you want that, that heat to bounce off and you want a lot of emittance. You want that, you want that roof to shed heat to the sky uh, to get the heat out of the attic, okay? Um, the, the numbers for uh, the requirements for cool roofs um, are only for hot climates, okay? All right, R value is usually described in insulating material. I mentioned that higher means less heat transfer. Uh, when, refer, when verifying R value against the CF1R, the, the number listed in the CF1R is a minimum. As long as they put in that number or more, they're okay. For U factors, it, it describes the entire assembly and lower is better. All right, let's talk about attics. Attics have gotten a lot of attention. It's very complicated. And I will tell you this, I just got back from a conference in Florida. We are so, so lucky that we live in a dry climate. I just got back from a building science HVAC conference in Florida and they have to deal with humidity and man, do they have a lot of issues. It gets, it gets really complicated. If you ever looked at a psychometric chart and try to figure out dew point and relative humidity and you know, all this other stuff versus temperature, man, they, it is complicated back there. So we are super lucky. Even so, we seem to have a real challenge dealing with attics. Um, so historically, most attics, your typical attic is a vented attic. That means the air is intended to pass through that attic, all right? And um, the venting, you know, the old one to 150, one to 300 requirement for attic venting. Um, I, let me say this to all the building inspectors and plant triggers in the room. Please, please, please enforce that. Enforce that, especially in, a, in the hotter climates. If you live in a, what we call a cream, cream puff climate, a really mild climate, um, it's not as important. But I have put data loggers in a house that didn't have adequate attic ventilation. And even when the outdoor temperature drops below the thermostat set point, that air conditioner was still running because all that heat is trapped in the attic and it's radiating down through the ceiling and making the house think it's still hot outside. And it was because the attic ventilation was not adequate. So please, please enforce the, the and, and I will tell you also that the one to 150, one to 300, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here. The one to 150, one to 300 rules, you know what those are intended to prevent? They're intended to prevent ice dams. They are not 
adequate for what we want them for, which is to get heat out of an attic. Okay, I actually did some research on this and I talked to the, the old building, the old retired building inspector that was on the committee that established those numbers. And I asked him where those numbers came from. And he says, oh, ice dams. You don't want ice dams in your house. We live in California. The only place that has ice dams is up in the mountains. We want to get heat out of our attic. These numbers are actually probably not enough for what we want them to do. So please, please enforce those numbers, especially in the hot climates. I have seen houses suffer greatly from inadequate attic ventilation. All right, but that's kind of the typical stuff. You got your insulation on the ceiling and basically think of the, the roof as an umbrella over the house. All the roof is doing is keeping the rain off the house. That's all it's doing, keeping the rain off the house and keeping the sun from hitting the house directly. So it's, it's an umbrella, that's all it really is. But the problem is, is if that umbrella is sitting right down on top of the house and is not ventilated, that heat builds up in the attic. Oh, and if your ducts are in the attic, guess what? Your ducts are now in a really, really hot climate and attic and duct leakage brings in all that hot air. I've been up in attics in Las Vegas where you lift up the attic access, you go, nope, I'm not going up there. It's crazy, crazy hot up there, okay? So when you have an attic, a ventilated attic, the, the roof is just an umbrella to protect the house from rain, okay? And you want as much ventilation underneath that. The best case scenario is that the attic temperature be the same as the outside temperature. That's the best you can do on a hot day. And it's almost impossible to do unless you have lots and lots and lots of ventilation. I get asked a lot about attic fans. Um, powered attic fans are not a great idea because they, put, they apply pressure to the attic and they can create a pressure differential between the house and can either suck air out of the house or blow pressure air into the house. I think um, those little solar attic fans are pretty good because they, don't, they can't create a lot of pressure. The sun comes up, they turn on, the sun goes down, they shut off. Um, those are all fine, but I think nice, passive, more than you need attic venting is the way to go, okay? All right, sorry, I got sidetracked there. Um, but now we're starting to see unvented attics or encapsulated attics. This is where they take the, the um, condition boundary, which was at the ceiling, and now they're moving it up to the roof. So now what is that attic? A lot of people say, well, shouldn't it be condition space? Well, it depends, okay? Think of it as kind of conditioned space, <laughs> all right? Um, it's not a place where people are gonna live. It's not, it's not finished, so to speak. Um, so it's generally not gonna be directly conditioned. You don't wanna put um, uh, supply registers in an unfinished attic. That's actually not allowed by code. Um, and so anyways, it brings the thermal boundary up, but it makes the attic a much nicer place than it would be for a regular vented attic, okay? And so it's a good place to have your ducts. Um, it's not as good as down inside condition space, but it's better than, an, than a vented attic. So you're gonna start, see, start seeing some of these um, unvented or encapsulated attics where the insulation, most of the time what you'll see, not all the time, but most of the time what you'll see is a spray on foam on the other side of the attic, okay? But there's a third kind of attic. And a lot of people confuse these with the unvented attic. It's called a high performance attic. It is a vented attic, but it has insulation under the roof deck and on the ceiling. And when I first saw this, I go, they put insulation under the roof deck. What good is that? If you're gonna have outside air circulating underneath that insulation, what good is the, under, the insulation that's up underneath the roof deck? You've already got ceiling insulation, okay? Well, it turns out it is pretty good to have it there, but don't think of it as insulation. Think of it as a super duper radiant barrier, okay? You've heard of radiant barriers, that shiny material, and when the sun hits the roof, the radiant barrier prevents that heat from conducting or radiating into the attic, and they work really well. This works even better. It prevents the radiant heat from coming through, but it also prevents heat from conducting through the roof into the attic. So it makes a vented attic much cooler than it would be otherwise, okay? Uh, I just question? wanted to note that it is 10, so just a 30 minute notice. Ah, perfect. Thank you so much. And I think I'm, I'm doing okay. I, I'm going to have to speed up at the end. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So high performance addicts. There you go. Um, these are actually required uh, by the prescriptive measures. So if you want to build your house prescriptively, you need to do this. If you don't want to do this, you're going to be penalized and you're going to have to do something else to make up that difference. Okay. So high performance attics, there's a whole section. Um, there's, a, there's a very good discussion in the residential compliance manual on high performance attics, okay? 
All right. Um, note that the attic is still ventilated. The purpose of the insulation at the roof is to prevent heat from coming in to the attic. Okay, much like a radiant berry, but much better. But it also helps in the wintertime too. It helps, it helps make the um, attic warmer in the wintertime. Okay, so there's four basic approaches to attics. There's insulated at the ceiling only. This is a traditional, uh, so there's vented and unvented. For vented attic, insulated at the ceiling only, this is a traditional attic. And then there's insulated, insulated at the ceiling and roof deck, that's a high performance attic. Both of those are vented. Then we have unvented attics. Most of the unvented attics you see are unfinished. Um, it's just a spray on foam on the other side or maybe some kind of bat stuck up against there. Um, that is an unfinished, we call that an indirectly conditioned attic. Um, in order to be a conditioned attic, it has to be finished. It has to be, basically it has to be sheetrocked, okay? And it has to have a supply register in that room, in that attic. You'll see those, usually they're for really tall rooms that are used for storage and stuff like that. Um, it's an unfinished, or sorry, it's a finished attic, but um, basically just used as storage, okay? Things like that. You don't see, those are very rare. All right, so there you go. Okay, cool roofs. Cool roof technology has improved roofing materials ability to reflect heat. So it's an additive that they add to the roofing material that makes it reflect it and it makes it uh, emit heat better. Okay, those products are tested by an organization called coolroof.org or Cool Roof Rating Council, coolroof.org. Um, and you want, there's two, they're gonna give you two numbers. They're gonna give you the initial and weathered. You wanna use the weathered. Um, basically this is saying new and after it's been there for a little while and because the house is going to be there for a long time, you want to use the weathered number. Um, and it's not quite as good as the initial number, but that's okay. It, it makes sense. It goes down because dust and stuff like that collects on the roof. Okay. But anyways, that's what you look for. So in other words, if a cool roof product is required, you need to see the label. The label is going to be on the packaging of the roofing material. And this is where you go to look for it. And you compare these numbers to the CF1R. In milder climates, most of the 3C REN climates um, is a mild climate and you're probably not gonna need a cool roof product, but it'll say right on the CF1R whether you go to, all right? Uh, question. Um, yeah, so two in the chat. The first is what are good values to shoot for? Uh, I presume that's for roofing materials? Since that's I, I would okay. think so. Um, good values to shoot for. That is a great question. Um, it's, it's really whatever, oh gosh, it's been so long. Um, it's, um, if you saw the mandatory measure says if roofing, if cool roof is required, it must be at least this. I think that's kind of your baseline. It needs to be better than that. Um, and so, it, it all really boils down to what the CF1R says. But if you're an energy consultant, you're going, all right, what should I type in? What's a good number? Well, type in a number, run it, and see if it makes a difference. Because there's like a threshold that you have to be better than that for it to start giving you credit. And I'm sorry, I don't remember what, exactly what those numbers are. I apologize. But um, uh, okay. I think if you look in the prescriptive checklist, it'll give you like the minimum that's allowed if you do it. Um, the other one says, uh, cool roof would seem to be valuable in any climate where the sun shines, but they decided it was only economical violent. Yes. How much does it really impact roof costs? Uh, that's another good question. How much does it cost? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, there is a case study that, that details that. When they proposed that measure, they had to do a whole bunch of studies, um, and they would, they would have that. I'm not sure exactly how much it costs rel relative to just plain old roofing materials. Um, and it's, it is only, it is only cost effective in the hotter climate zones because it's saving a lot of cooling energy. Um, milder climate zones don't have as much cooling energy. And I think it hurts you a little bit in the winter because, you know, you, you want your attic to be warm in the winter and it's actually making the attic less warm in the winter time. It's just that in hotter climates, the benefit in the summer greatly outweighs the, whatever little negative uh, impact there is in the winter time. Okay. That's, that's why it's required in some climate zones, but I don't, I honestly don't know what cost difference are. Maybe someone does. Um, that'd be interesting to, to know. Okay. When verifying these values against the compliance documentation, the listed value is a minimum. So you want to be, you want to be better. So what's on the label needs to be the same or higher than what's on the CF1. Okie doke. Moving right along. Um, 
All right, mandatory and prescriptive measures. Um, these are all in the checklist. So these are mandatory measures, that checklist that you have in your handouts. These are all listed in here. This is just kind of, uh, you know, elaborating on that. So leakage through joints, penetration, cracks, holes, all that stuff, caulked, sealed, that's all a mandatory measure. Um, all the openings have to be caulked, sealed, gasketed, weather stripped, all the joints around windows, door frames. This bottom plate has to be caulked and sealed. This backside of any sheathing like that has to be caulked and sealed. That's part of the QII requirements. Okay, notice there's a little gap right there. They don't always do a great job on this stuff. Um, around gas lines, um, any soffits, things like that have to be sealed around uh, where any chases where ducts run through that's separating attic from, from inside the walls. That all has to be caulked and sealed. Uh, roof constructed attics. This is new, mandatory change for 2022. It is now mandatory in certain climate zones. And I think 3C Ren is in, there's some climate zone four and maybe some climate zone nine in 3C Ren. Um, mandatory, you have to have roof deck insulation and it can either be a rigid under the shingles or it could be a bat under the roof deck, which is more common, okay? That's a new requirement. And the, the bat is R5. Okay. Um, the minimum, the least amount of ceiling insulation you can install is R22. That's the least you can install. Even if you could, even if you could do a computer simulation and show that R13 passes, can't do it. You got to do at least R22. Uh, and there's where it says it. Okay, that's a, a little snip of the of the checklist, uh, mandatory measures checklist that's in your handouts. Uh, wall insulation, the least amount of insulation you can put in a two by four wall is R13. The least amount of insulation, oh, that is wrong. We need to update that, that side. It's actually R20, okay? Um, the least amount of insulation you can have in a two by six wall or greater is R20. Basically, they want that, they want that wall to be completely filled, okay? And there's where it says it. R13 in a two by four, R20 in a two by six. Um, note that the prescriptive requirements assume high performance attics with insulation at the ceiling and the deck. So that's a prescriptive requirement. Remember that the prescriptive packages are mostly used to establish the target energy budget for the performance approach. It's what you're being compared to. You don't have to do a high performance attic, but if you choose not to, you have to do something better to make up the difference somewhere else. It can be water heater, it can be air conditioner, whatever. Your overall energy use just has to be better. That's, a, that's the, another nice thing. I didn't say that very clearly before, but with the performance approach, you can trade off air conditioning against heating, against water heating, against windows, against insulation, all that stuff, all that energy gets thrown into a big pot and stirred up and it's the final number that matters, okay? Um, let's see, remember that the prescriptive packages are mostly used to establish got that. Prescriptive measures can be traded off against other features or extra credits. All right, a new, another change for 2022, additions and roof ceilings. Um, additions that are 700 square feet or less shall meet the requirements of this, this, this 150.1C. Um, and basically, basically what they did is in some climate zones, they raise it from R30 to R38. That's really what it really happened. Um, let's see. If you're adding onto a house more than 700 square feet, and you're in these climate zones, it has to be R38. These climate zones has to be R30. Mandate, uh, sorry, prescriptive men. Prescriptive. All right, let's talk about windows. So to be installed in a home in California, manufactured windows must be tested and rated by the National Fenestration Rating Council. There is a, there used to be, I know, I'm not sure if there is, that's just the question that came up earlier. Is there an exception to this for, for like custom doors and custom windows? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I think there might still be. I know there used to be. Uh, it was like 30 square feet or something like that. Um, uh, and then there's also, you know, also I believe it says there's a weighted average too. Um, so you can, if some of your windows are better, uh, you can do a weighted average to show that you're putting in some windows that aren't as good. But I'm not sure about the labeling though. That's, that's the question. Um, so anyways, windows are tested. The two important numbers are the U factor and the solar heat gain coefficient. Okay, there's another number of visible transmittance and there's air leakage. Those, you don't ever really have to check those in residential, but U factor and solar heat gain coefficient, this label is going to be stuck on the window. I highly recommend building departments to have a big red stamp that they put on the plans that says, do not remove the labels until the building inspector tells you it's okay to do so. Because if, the, if they get pulled off before the building inspector gets to the project, 
how's the building inspector going to check it? You can look down in the track sometimes and see a little code, but then that's a lot more work. It's much, much better if the building inspector can just walk up, hold the CF1R, compare the CF1R to this label, say, yep, you're good to go. Now on this one, lower is better. You want the numbers on the labels to be lower than the numbers in the CF1Rs, okay? All right, um, overhangs. If overhangs are modeled on the CF1R, you need to go out and check it. Each overhang is gonna have three numbers. The extension, which is how far out it projects from the window, the height above the window, and then the height of the window. Those three things come into play um, when you start looking at how the sun passes over the house and whether or not the shadow of that overhang is gonna be cast on that window and for how long. Okay, so how far out it sticks, how far above the window it is, and how tall the window is. Those are three important numbers. And I'll show you where those are on the CF1R. And then there's also a left extension and right extension. Most overhangs are the eave of the roof, and, and so those have a long extension. But occasionally you'll see an overhang kind of like this. It's just a little small overhang. And then if it's not very wide, the sun can shine in from the side and hit the window. Okay. Uh, most overhangs, like I said, are, are eaves and pretty much are, you know, extend a long ways. Okay, um, let's talk about HERS verification for envelope measures. There are two HERS measures. There are two envelope special for performance credits that when taken require field verification by a HERS rater. That is QII, which is you're gonna see on most new construction. I would say 95 to 98% of all new construction is gonna require QII. And how do you know? You just look on the CF1R, it'll tell you right at the beginning. Um, another one, not nearly as common, um, but eh, you see if you have it depends on your climate zone, is a credit called reduced infiltration. That's basically making the house extra tight. When they take credit for the house being tighter than a certain amount, that triggers the blower door test. So our HERS is going to come out and put a blower door in the house and measure the infiltration in that house. Okay. All other envelope measures are varied by verified by the building inspector. Okay. The CEC for QII, uh, we have a whole class on QII, a uh, great class, and there's a lot to learn there. And QII is a very, very interesting credit. Um, basically, it's the, the Energy Commission assumes guilty until proven innocent. And what I mean by that is they did a big study and they found that on average, insulation is installed horribly. And not just on average, but like by 99.9% by of the homes they checked, the insulation was installed poorly. And they said, well, since it's so wide common, we're just gonna assume that it's installed badly, unless you prove otherwise. And to prove otherwise, you do a QII, which it requires some extra verification by the HERS rating. Okay, if the builder does not wanna be penalized for bad installation, they have to prove that it's installed correctly. And to do that, um, the HERS rater comes out and checks it before the insulation goes in to make sure the house is sealed properly and there's good air barriers. And then after the insulation goes in to make sure the insulation was installed correctly. So here's a tip for building departments. If the QII credit is taken, the HERS rater will perform a very thorough inspection on the insulation so the building inspector doesn't have to do quite as much. But I really encourage building department, building inspectors and HERS raters to, to coordinate, right? Um, and, and if a building department sees insulation that's not installed correctly and knows the house has QII, find out if it's been inspected by the HERS rate or not. If it hasn't, tell the installer, go, look, I'm pretty sure the HERS rate is gonna fail that. I think you should do it correctly. And as a building inspector, you have every right. I also think building inspectors should take the QII training and just learn to do the QII inspections and verifications themselves too, and just be, be educated in that. Because QII really is how insulation is supposed to be installed. It's not something the Energy Commission made up. The QII comes from insulation manufacturers' instructions on how you're supposed to install insulation. Okay, so anyways, take the QII class. Lower door test, like I mentioned, if a builder says, um, oh, I'm gonna build my house super, super tight, and the energy consultant models the house as super, super tight, that triggers a blower door test, which means the HERS rate is gonna come out, hook up this tool called the blower door, it's a big fan that fits into the door and it pressurizes the house and measures how leaky it is, okay? The builder can take credit for building an extra tight house if they want to, the HERS rate has to come out and do it. Here's another tip for building apartments, just to kind of take a little pressure off you. 
if if the blower test is being done, you don't have to worry too much or as much about caulking and sealing, okay? Because it's going to be tested, okay? However, here's the problem: if they test it and it fails, it's really hard to go back and caulk and seal some of the stuff after it's been covered up with drywall. All right, so I almost would recommend don't follow this tip. Is go ahead and enforce it anyways, um, because if, they, like I said, if they fail it, it's hard to seal a house after it's been built. It's not impossible. Uh, in fact, there's a product. Uh, there's a there's a there's a mist that they can blow in the house, and the mist finds the leaks. It's um, arrow barrier. It's called, um, but um, it's it works well. But it's you know it's not necessary if they do it right in the first time. Okay. Uh, let's look at the envelope measures. Let's look at a CF1R Perf 01. I promise you we would look at that and we've got, oh, just less than 15 minutes left. So take a Perf 01, any old Perf 01, and look at it. There's one in your handouts. Right? This, the one we're going to look at is one of the things in your handouts. Okay, you look up in the top corner here, it says CF1R Perf 01. This first page is basic information. This is all important. This is stuff, and from a, from a plan trigger's perspective, this is all stuff you should verify. It's got address, it's got city, it's got climate zone, it's got the type of building, it's got the type of project, it's got the square footage, it's got the um, software version, it's got the code version. This is all important stuff. And this should all be verified against the plans and against the permit application, okay? Notice up here it says page one of 14, okay? <clears throat> oh, looks like someone found the answer, 10 square feet, or 5% of the condition floor area. I think that's the exception to um, the glass for, for custom homes. That's not very much, 10 square feet is not very much. Um, okay, um, so notice it says page one of 14. We're gonna look at the first 10 because that's the ones that have that have envelope information on it. Uh, in the Bayron new construction class, we go through the entire CF1R start to finish and show you what everything is and identify important stuff. In this one, we're just gonna we're gonna focus on envelope stuff, and we're just gonna tell you which sections of the CF1R are are important or not. Okay, so let's go to page two. Here's page two. Shows if it passes. Well, you can't print out a CF1R unless it passes. <laughs> so every single CF1R you're gonna look at that's been uh, registered at least. Oh, and remember I, my my warning. If you see a certificate that says it's pretty self-explanatory. This certificate of compliance is not registered. Do not accept that. A certificate of compliance has to be registered before you, a building department will accept it. I just printed this one out directly from the software as an example, okay? So fair warning. But every registered CF1R you look at, this is gonna say pass. You cannot print a CF1R. You cannot register a CF1R unless that says pass. So you don't really have to check that. It kind of goes without saying. Uh, this is all the details about whether or not it passes. So here's your standard uh, energy design rating, your TDV energy design rating for all your space heating, space fuel, ventilation, water heating, blah, 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 blah. This is a lot of information. It's got all the nitty gritty behind the scenes stuff, um, whether or not it passes. In my opinion, that's TMI. That's too much information. Some people might find it useful occasionally, uh, but it's very rare, okay? Um, I just saw a registered CF1R that showed a negative number under the compliance margin. You can have some negative numbers um, under the compliance margin, but the overall number has to be positive, which you go up here, compliance margin. It should not have a negative number up here. If it did, that's very strange. Um, why would it do that? I can't think of why it would do that. Lower is better. Oh, maybe it was, maybe it was. It was a net zero house. It was actually less than zero. That's possible. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, it, if it's a registered CF1R, double check that. Oh, if it was on this oh, on this page. Okay. Um, yeah, very interesting. It might be one of these um, other EDRs that's being added to the total, so that it's a less number. I think that you might get a negative number if your if your PV system is is a lot larger than it needs to be. Okay. So, yeah, there you go. Um, okay, moving on. So on page three, you got energy intensity shows how much it passes by. Um, this is kind of this is kind of useful. It it gives you an idea of how much it passes by. 
if it if it only passes by a teeny 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 little tiny margin that means if anything's wrong in the cf1r it that little mistake could potentially make it not comply anymore but if it if it complies by a big margin then they can make little mistakes and the house will still still comply that's kind of useful information uh there's a whole thing about pv that's important building departments building inspectors whatever it says here make sure that's what gets installed that's super important stuff same with batteries. If they're putting in a battery, they're taking credit for it. Uh, and if, if it shows up here, um, you need they need to install whatever shows up here or better, okay? Uh, special features, it's kind of important. It's just a list of things I'm saying, hey, you may wanna check this stuff. It's kind of unusual, you may wanna go check it. So that special features list is kind of important. The HERS feature summary is very important. If you see, this is all the HERS measures that this house needs. There's QII. Indoor air quality, every house needs that. Kitchen range hood, pretty much every house needs that. Whole house fan airflow uh, and fan efficacy. That is the, that's a whole house fan. So that's something else. <clears throat> Minimum airflow for the HVAC system, verified refrigerant charge, ver uh, fan efficacy and duct leakage. So, and this list changes depending on the, on the house, but this is important information. This is saying, hey, all these first tests need to be done. Uh, building features, this is kind of important. This is as a condition floor area and number of uh, ventilation systems, number of HVAC systems, number of water heating systems, okay? A lot of this stuff also appears on the page one um, stuff, so it's kind of important. Zone information is kind of important. It'll talk about, um, you know, it'll list all the zones here. Um, <clears throat> but then, page six. Now we get into the uh, envelope stuff. You're gonna see a section called opaque surfaces. This is a list of all the opaque surfaces, what zone it's attached to, the azimuth, the orientation, the area, window and door area, and tilt in degrees, uh, tilt in degrees, okay? Front left back walls, garage to house front, garage ceiling, ceiling, garage front, garage wall left, garage wall right, okay? And then this is important here. This column three is a construction type. This references another section. So this front wall on the condition zone is called an R21, R5 stucco wall. This is just a name. This is just a reference to look somewhere else to find this thing. Just because it says R21 in the name doesn't mean it was modeled with R21. You have to go check it to see what was actually modeled. I've seen it where the R value was used in the name but did not match the R value that was actually modeled in the wall. And I'll show you that in just a second, okay? So you need to check all these, make sure those look right, but then you need to go look at these and make sure they make sense, okay? Attic is kind of important. You'll talk, it'll say ventilator, unventilated. Whatever it says here, make sure that's what they did. If they say ventilated, if they say it's ventilated and then saw a non and unventilated attic, they probably will get a credit, but that's kind of weird. And it probably should be modeled correctly. Uh, if they modeled an encapsulated attic, but then do a ventilated attic, that's that's going to hurt them. Okay. So so whatever they say here, make sure it's accurate. Uh, fenestration, super important. If the only thing you check on a CF1R is the windows, you're doing a, a, you're doing a good job. You're doing a fair to good job. Um, windows are the most important feature, envelope feature in a house. One square foot of window is equal to 25 square foot of wall in terms of heat transfer and stuff like that. That's a safe number. So you should be very, um, plan checkers, make sure the windows on the CF1R match the windows on the plans. In the Bayron new construction class, we show you how to go through and add up all the windows really quick and then compare that to the CF1Rs, add it up by orientation, compare it to the CF1R, and it takes about 15 or 20 minutes to do that on a, on a fairly complicated house, okay? Um, but that's important. If they miss a window and they don't model it in the house, that, that all by itself can affect compliance of a house, okay? Depending on the size and orientation of the window, of course. Okay, here's more of this. So this list of windows goes continues on to the next page, all right? And then you get into opaque doors. Opaque doors, in my opinion, should be ignored. <laughs> I just don't think they're worth the effort. Uh, I've had, I've had, uh, CF1Rs be rejected by the building department because they missed an opaque door and we put the opaque door that somebody put the opaque door back in. It made a difference out to like a fourth decimal on compliance. It had no impact whatsoever. Sorry, I'm getting on my getting distracted here. Um, 
let's see. What about skylights? Don't they have a sink? Yes, skylights will come under windows. Skylights will come under windows. Um, you'll have windows here and oh, uh, in this column here, if it's a skylight, it will say skylight instead of window. Uh, sliding glass doors are considered windows and French doors, if the glass is more than 50% of the area of the door will also be considered windows, okay? But in solid wood doors. Uh, here is the overhangs and side fins. So overhangs, what I like to do is I just scan this first column depth and I look for the longer ones. So here's one that's four feet deep and here's one that's six feet deep. Those will cast a significant shadow on the windows, therefore giving very reasonable credit in a hot climate zone, okay? And so all these one foot overhangs, I don't care too much about those. They have hardly any impact. Um, but I scan through here and see four. Okay, and then I look on the plans. Where is there a four foot overhang on the plans? Where is there a six foot overhang on the plans? And verify those. Those are having a pretty significant impact, okay? Slab floors, um, just make sure, you know, if, if, they, if they're modeling as a slab floor, make sure it gets built as a slab floor. I've actually seen that mistake. They model it as a raised floor house and then install a slab floor, okay? That's, that'll mess you up. Okay, two minutes, um, three minutes. Building envelope, PERS verification, very, very important. If you see the word required here, that's gonna generate a CF3R, okay? Um, oh, can you clarify the carpet fraction part of the slab specs? Yes. Um, slab, 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 area, perimeter, edge, 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 carpeted fraction. Um, this actually has a very small impact um, from what I've seen. But basically, you're looking at your slab. The garage has no carpet on it. And this is saying a conditioned slab, 2,100 square feet. 80% of that 2,100 square feet has carpet on it. I think carpet hurts in terms of an it, it, it insulates the slab. No, I take that back. It depends on your climate zone. In a hot climate zone, you don't want carpet on your slab. You want that heat, you want that cooling effect of the slab. So less carpet is better in a hot climate zone, more carpet is better, but it's just an estimate. You, you look at the plans, you say these bedrooms are probably caught carpet in them. But then if they come back and install, you know, laminate floors everywhere, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Try this, run it with zero carpet, and run it with 100% carpet and see how much of a difference it makes on your compliance margin. That, that will change depending on the climate zone, okay? Um, all right, again, building envelope verification, if, if it says required, it's gotta be done. And that's it. Last thing, real quick, best practices, check the CF1R measures against the plans, especially windows. Inspect the non-HERS measures, this is for building departments. Inspect the non-HERS measures in the field compared to the CF2R, especially windows. Use the HERS registry to track the forms. That's super important, okay? Know which HERS verified measures are required to avoid duplicate inspections. And resources, Google this number right here and you'll bring up the new code, the 2022 code. Just Google that number right there. That's the CEC publication number. And another great document that I highly recommend all building departments have is the residential compliance manual. Think of that as the user's guide to the energy code. It's a huge document but it's a free PDF. Download this and each chapter, there's a whole chapter. Chapter three is building envelope requirements. And it's a really good enhancement to this class, okay? And that's it. I'll turn it over to you, Gray. All right, great. Thank you so much, Russ. Uh, if you have any unanswered questions or remaining questions, I linked to our Energy Code coach in the chat. Um, I'm also including my email um, for any questions regarding this course or your credits. Um, and then finally, this is our Q1 course calendar. Um, Russ is doing another class tomorrow on heating and cooling um, comfort problems in homes. So feel free to check that out and register. Um, and you will all be receiving these slides, a recording of this presentation and links to all of the handouts um, by tomorrow afternoon. So thank you all very much uh, and have a great rest of your day. I would like to point out that it is exactly 1030. I don't think that has ever happened before. <laughs> All right, that. Russ, we make a good team. <laughs> That's right, good job, good job. Thanks everyone, we appreciate it. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's class is uh, diagnosing comfort problems in homes. Uh, kind of interesting stuff. All right, thanks everyone.